Welcome back. This is the learning module for our first discussion of memory processes. We're actually going to have two learning modules on this. So this is the first one called Memory One. Let's get started. There's a ton of content here. Uh, go ahead and make sure you've read Chapter 8. This is Part 1 of 2 on Memory 1, and we're going to cover some topics that were discussed in the chapter. Here's a basic layout of what we will do. And in this part, we will do one and two here. Questions about memory, which is really quick. And then we'll talk about some early memory research. In the second part, we're going to connect uh, the information processing module to questions about human memory. And let's get started. So I think human memory and memory in general is extremely interesting. And I've just got a short list of questions here for us to consider. Uh, so let's think of some questions about memory. What is it like for you to remember something from your past? Um, this is a little bit like the mental imagery questions. How many events from your experience can you remember? Why can you remember something from years ago, but forget new information from seconds ago? So for example, I can remember my phone number from when I was a kid but I can't remember my parents' new phone number. How do you preserve your experiences so that they can be remembered later on? Uh, why is it sometimes hard to remember something, but later on the answer just kind of pops in your head? What's going on there? How can you improve your memory? How can you forget things that you don't want to think about? Uh, what, what about other animals besides humans? Do they have memories? How are memories encoded, stored, and retrieved in the brain? How do people use their environment to help them remember things? So this is just a short list of questions about human memory in cognitive psychology. Um, all of these questions have been explored in various ways. And we're going to talk about some of these explorations. In this section on early memory research, the plan is to introduce you to four different people there's lots of different people that have done research on human memory, and these are some uh, historical people. So the first one is Hermann Ebbinghaus. Then we have Frederick Bartlett, Bluma Zygarnik, and Hedwig von Restorff. So for the rest of this part, we're going to go through each of these four people and talk about some of the work they did that informed our knowledge about how memory processes work. Here's Herman Ebbinghaus, and he's up here because he conducted some of the very first experimental investigations of human memory. And this is back in 1855. If you want to read his uh, original work, you can click this link here and go check it out. It's still very well written, and I think the things he was doing back then are uh, he had a big imprint, so people are still doing memory research in similar ways to Ebbinghaus. What did he do? Well, he was one of the first people to systematically measure the rates of learning something and the rates of forgetting something. One thing that was unique about the way he did the research was that he conducted it on himself. So he was the subject in his own research. He also invented the use of nonsense material, sometimes called CVC syllables for a consonant vowel consonant. Here were some of his big questions. One, how do people learn new associations? If we think about the time period, if we think about other things we've learned in this course, um, he is thinking about associationism, and he's wondering if we can experimentally study how people form new associations. He was also interested in what happens to learning about new associations with delays between practice. In other words, uh, do you forget things when you're not practicing them? So when he set about to study how he learns new associations. He noted some issues uh, with this potential, with his potential experiments. He noted that people already have existing associations from their experience. He was interested in 
the study of learning new associations. So he had a methodological insight, and his idea was to adopt a task with very little pre-existing familiarity. He devised this serial learning task that we're going to uh, take a look at in a moment. And his task was measuring how long it took people, or himself, because he was the only person in the experiment, to recite a list of items from memory. He used artificial stimuli so that pre-existing familiarity with the items would not interfere with the learning process. Now briefly, if I was to recall a list of items from memory, I can do that. For example, what are the days of the week? Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Boom, I can do that, no problem. But I already learned that. That is very familiar to me. Ebbinghaus was interested in creating new things that he didn't already know and try to learn the order of those new things. Here's an example of the stimuli that he created. These are called nonsense syllables. They have a consonant vowel consonant structure. If we just zoom into some of them, H O Z V U K J A L and so on. So here we have on the first row, a whole long list of 13 of these things. And you could uh, try to pronounce them out loud. For example, Haas, Vuk, Jal, Ziu, Viu, San, Waj, Jik, Zuk, Rir, Zok, Jev, Riz. I don't know really how to pronounce these things, but let's say that's 13 of them. Now, if I was to just take that away, Ebbinghaus was testing his ability to recite the list one time, just like I did. And now he tested himself, how many can he say in a row perfectly? Let me see if I can try. Haas. I don't know, I can't remember anymore. <laughs> so let's see, did I get the first one right? Um, Okay, Haas, sure. Uh, clearly, my, my memory's not very good. I would need to practice saying these 13 things in a row a whole bunch of times before I could have a, a hope in trying to say all 13 in a row just by memory. So this was a preview of Ebbinghaus's task. He was learning how to recite whole lists of nonsense syllables. There was two basic phases in his task, the learning phase and relearning after a delay. Uh, we're going to take a look at a modern replication of Ebbinghaus's results. So this was done in 2015. And if you're interested in this paper, you can click this link here and go take a look at it. Here's what the authors did. They also did a learning phase, and I think it was one or two of the authors who did single subject research, so they also did this task on themselves a whole bunch of times. And what they did was practice reciting a row here until they could recite it perfectly one time from memory, and then they moved on to the next row. So if we zoomed in this first row, just like I recited it out loud, you would recite it out loud, and then you would try to recite it from memory. And if you couldn't do it, you go back and recite it out loud and practice, and then try again from memory. And you keep going back and forth and trying again until you can do the whole thing perfect from memory. If you do it one time, perfect. Then you go to the second row and you start trying to do that second row back and forth, back and forth until you can do the second row perfect. And then you go to the third row. That's a lot of lists, right? Ebbinghaus did hundreds, maybe even thousands of these. Now, why bother learning all these lists of nonsense syllables? What's the point of this? One, I guess one point is that People can do it if you practice here. 
enough times, you can learn to recite 13 basically random syllables that you never heard before. And I mean, we already know that we can learn things, so it's not a huge surprise that people can practice and learn to recite these things. But what Ebbinghaus was interested in measuring also, in addition to the ability to learn the sequences, was what happens after uh, delays? What happens to your learning? Do you forget what you learned? If you, for example, wait a day or two days and then try to recite the list? Now, Ebbinghaus learned a list and then he would wait very systematic amounts of time before trying to recite the list again. For example, in the relearning after a delay phase, and these authors waited 20 minutes, one hour, nine hours, or one, two, six, or 31 days between the time when they recited a whole list one time perfect, and then when they gave themselves a memory test for that list to see how well they could do it. Importantly, uh, part of that memory test wasn't just, oh, can I do it? It was, and it's in the title here, relearning after a delay. So you might imagine if you waited 31 whole days before you tried to recite a list that you learned 31 days ago, you might be like, I don't know, can't even say anything. So you, it would seem as if you forgot everything and you know that that could be one one interpretation instead of doing that on day 31 or after any of these delays the task was to get the list back again so you'd see the things you're trying to remember and then you just relearn the list and the question is um, can you relearn the list faster the second time was there any savings in relearning? So here we have some data showing original learning. The question here is how many practice attempts were necessary to memorize a row of nonsense syllables? So you might be wondering if you were trying to look at these things here, how many times would you have to recite these 13 things in row one in order for you to do it one time perfect from memory? Here's how long this person took, about 30 times. Okay, if we see the number of attempts here, it was about 30 times. So that's a lot of practice. You have to say that thing 30 times before you could do it one time perfect. So it took 30 attempts to memorize each row. When we start asking about forgetting, we can look at savings in relearning. The question here is how many attempts were required to relearn a list after these delays? And again, the delays were right here. So let's take a look at that data. We have this plotted in two different ways. Up here is what I just showed you, the original learning. It takes about 30 attempts to learn each row. Let's take a look at the relearning plotted right here. And this is plotted on a scale uh, on the bottom here is the delay in minutes. So we have 20 minutes. These, these ones are less than a day. And then these are the long, uh, 31 days, probably that thing. Uh, 31 days, six days, two days, one day, nine hours, one hour, 20 minutes. The blue line is just a reference for us. It's just how many times it took to learn the list originally. And it was always about 30 times. These black dots down here with the connected black line show how many at relearning attempts were necessary. So for example, when you learn the list, and again, it took 30 times, and then you wait 20 minutes, that's this first dot right here, if you wait 20 minutes, what happens? Uh, can you recite the list perfectly after 20 minutes? Nope. 
In fact, you need to relearn the list a bunch of times before you can recite it perfectly again. However, the first time you did that took 30, that's up here, and after the delay, look what happens. It doesn't take 30 times again. You already did it one time, 30 times. <laughs> the second time, it only takes you 16 times. So you haven't completely forgotten what you learned. If you'd completely forgotten everything, it would still take you 30 times because it's like how often, how many times it takes you when you don't know anything. So this is a savings in relearning. Um, if you perfectly remembered everything from before, you would take zero attempts after the delay because you'd know how to do it perfectly one time right away. So what we're seeing here is the savings in relearning. And as we increase the delay, what we're seeing is it takes people even more relearning attempts, more and more and more. And that is a measure of forgetting. Another way we can plot this, because uh, it's kind of hard to see, well, there's two things we can, if we plot it over here, um, we are not preserving the metric structure of the uh, temporal intervals. So for example, the interval between a 20 minutes and one hour is much shorter than between six days and 31, which is much longer. And this scale shows that over here. But this can help us see uh, how much relearning was needed across these different intervals. So here we are remembering quite a bit. So we only need 16 relearning trials, but after 31 days of a delay, it, there is still some evidence that you've retained some information. So it doesn't take you this many relearning attempts. It takes you a few less, but it, you still have to spend quite a few learning attempts there. Here is one of the main uh, points that Ebbinghaus made when he did his research. And this point was that in his task, he showed evidence of an exponential forgetting function. So he's the first person to show evidence for this. What does this mean? It means that most forgetting occurs immediately after learning. That's the first part. And the rate of forgetting slows down as the delay increases. We have this in a picture right here. So if you think about when you're learning something, at the point in time when you've learned it, uh, shortly after that period of time is when you do a lot of forgetting. As the time between your learning and you know, the future gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Over that much longer period of time, you for, you've already forgotten, you know, some amount, but you forget less and less and less. So uh, early on, there's lots of forgetting. And then later on, that rate slows down. One way to think about this, I put it over here. Exponential forgetting is like going to Las Vegas and spending most of your money on the first day, and then slowly losing the rest of it over the whole week. Okay, next person, Sir Frederick Bartlett. He was a British psychologist. He published a book called Remembering in 1932, and he's famous for the reconstructionist view of memory. This is a really great book if you get your hands on it. It's really fun to read. And he has another book that's fun to read too called Thinking. And I would encourage you to read both of those books by Bartlett. Uh, he was doing research in cognition and memory during the heyday of American behaviorism. And so he's uh, kind of an interesting figure that way because he was definitely thinking about uh, internal cognitive processes. Um, 
Before we talk about his main idea, let me briefly say there's lots of different metaphors that researchers use to think about memory processes. And some of these are helpful, some of them are unhelpful, some of them are maybe have a little bit more truth to them than others, some of them aren't really at all like how human memory works. So for example, here's a me metaphor for thinking about, well, how is it that you take information in, save it somewhere and get it back out? Is it like a file drawer? I mean, file drawers, you open them up, you put stuff in them, you can save the stuff in there, and then when you want to get it back out again, you can open up the drawer and take it out. Is memory like that? We just put our experiences into little memory files. Is memory like a camera? So with our phones or something like that, you could take a picture and that picture takes a really nice, um, uh, it reflects the light that was hitting the lens. It's roughly a vertical uh, representation of what the lens was seeing. And it just might save that thing somewhere in a, in like your photos app or whatever. Uh, another way to think about memory, and I think this was a fun one, is memory is like a bent wire. If you think about a wire, um, and if you were to take this wire around in your world and do things like hit it on things and bend it around, um, the shape of the wire as it would um, reflect all the things that banged into it. So it doesn't really store all the images or doesn't have all the files anywhere, but the, the structure of that wire and how it's bendy reflects uh, its history of experiences with the world and how the world kind of hit that wire. Now, actually, let me say one more thing about the file drawer idea and the, the memory is a camera idea. And we'll come across these notions later on. Uh, both of those ideas suggest that what you put into memory is what you get out of memory. So if I take a picture and I put that into my memory, if I want to remember the picture, I just have to go back and find it somewhere and I can look at that thing. And then my memory of what that is, is the same as the picture that I took earlier. However, there's lots of evidence that memory is not so perfect. And human memory has biases and you can have false memories. The camera metaphor and the file drawer metaphor don't explain how you could think you remembered something that you didn't actually previously experience because those false memories wouldn't be in your photos app. So we have to have a different metaphor for memory that can capture some of the illusions of memory that people experience. And this is where Bartlett comes in. His metaphor for memory, I'll call it the Humpty Dumpty metaphor. Another way to think about it is that memory literally means remembering. That is putting back together the pieces of a prior experience. And so Bartlett saw memory as this active process of reconstruction. And that's really interesting because what that means, if you think about a previous experience you had, it's not, according to Bartlett, it's not like you just like bring it up and like review it, like you're rewinding a videotape and pressing play or something like that. It's more like you have this ability to reassemble things. And that new thing that you made as a part of your reassembling is, uh, appears to feel like a prior experience. Interesting idea. And Bartlett will also say that as we try to put back together our prior experiences, uh, sometimes we don't put them back together exactly the right way. And there are biases here. So some of his big questions were, how do people reconstruct a prior memory? Also, it's a little bit like Ebbinghaus, but slightly different. Uh, Ebbinghaus tried to remember lists of things over and over and over again, and he practiced doing it over and over and over again. Bartlett wasn't so interested in that, but he was interested in how your memory might change over successive rememberings. So if you remember something now, you have to reconstruct what happened and then you have some idea of what happened. What if you wait and then you try to remember that thing again? 
and you keep doing that. Does your memory stay the same every time you remember a prior experience? Or does your memory kind of drift and change as you learn how to reconstruct those experiences differently? Bartlett explored these questions using what he called the method of serial reproduction. And his experiments had two general phases. One, there was some encoding phase where people learned uh, some new information. And two, there was a reproduction phase and people had to reproduce this information from memory. But they also did this many times. So they'd reproduce the information, wait, maybe a day or two, reproduce the information again, and so on. And he did this in various ways. Sometimes he'd show people a story and then he'd have them write down the story and then write down the story again and then write down the story again. And if you've ever played the game Telephone, uh, where somebody says something to somebody and that person says somebody to somebody and so on, as it goes around the room, what ends up uh, as the final message is very different from the first message. And Bart found evidence of that uh, within people. So when people repeat the story from memory multiple times, the story starts drifting away from the original. He also did it with pictures. We'll take a look at a picture example. This is from an experiment that he called Le Portrait d'Homme. And in this experiment, he showed people this picture right here. This is the original drawing. So you would get to look at this picture and then you would be given a blank piece of paper and he would say, okay, get out your pencil and draw everything that I showed you. And here is right here, the first reproduction that somebody did. This is just an example from one person. So we could compare the first reproduction to the original drawing. And if I look at this one and I look at that one, I think, yeah, they're pretty similar, right? And then Bartlett would tell that person to go home and come back the next day. And here's your blank piece of paper. And how about you draw that same thing again? So here's the second reproduction. Now this one looks kind of like the first one, kind of like the original. It's starting to change a little bit. Let's look what happens as Bartlett asked this person to systematically reproduce the picture. So there's the third reproduction. There's the fourth reproduction. There's the fifth one. There's the sixth one, seven and eight and nine. And what we see here is a progression where the redrawings systematically change and become very different from the original drawing. Bartlett had a bunch of people do this and what he noted in his participants' behavior was that the redrawings seem to hone in on a schematic idea. So you might look at this picture and because in French it says a portrait of a man and even though this is an abstract kind of squiggly things, it kind of looks like, I don't know, a mask or something like that. Uh, Bartlett's thinking that as people keep redrawing this, this general schema of, oh, it's a portrait of a man starts taking over and rather than drawing the details of the picture, the, the remembered drawings start looking more like the general idea, which is a picture of a man. And so this person's picture started looking more like a person. It's kind of a fascinating demonstration. I, I always thought this was very interesting when I read about it, first uh, reading that book by Bartlett. So this was his suggestion that Remembering processes are guided by general schemas and that people may distort their original experiences as they remember things. Your memory might be kind of distorted towards a, a central schema or central idea. I should note that in 2012, these two authors tried to replicate this study and they call it the unreplicated series from 1932. 
Uh, here's an example of why it was unreplicated. Part of it was unreplicated and part of it wasn't. So they had people uh, in, I guess, 2012, they showed those people the same kind of stimuli that Bartlett showed his participants, like this mask right here. And then they had participants redraw these things over time from memory. And here's an example, uh, it's kind of hard to see, but of somebody's redrawings of this thing. And here's a different picture that you could have seen as an original drawing. And here's some remembering attempts. So what do you notice that's the same or that's different from Bartlett's original? One thing that's the same is that people's drawings do change as they try to redraw from memory. So that's definitely happening. Two, the drawings, or sorry, one thing that's different is that the drawings don't appear to become more like faces. The, this drawing looks like egg, like an Easter egg or something like that. This one looks like a Humpty Dumpty maybe, I don't know. They both become egg-like things. Uh, so they don't become faces. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Why don't people do, uh, why don't people in 2012 do exactly what was going on with, with Bartlett's participants in 1932? There could be lots of explanations for this. And this is part of the puzzle in cognition, trying to work out why a procedure would produce one set of results in, at one time and a different set of results at a different time. And I'll, I'll note here that with respect to Bartlett's work in 1932, he didn't often do a very precise job of explaining his methods. So it was clear enough in general what he did, but it wasn't necessarily clear exactly how he did it. So what did he tell people? Uh, what did he actually show people? What were all the parameters of the task? And so these authors in 2012 were doing a little bit of guesswork. It's possible that if they knew exactly what Bartlett was doing, that they would replicate the work a little bit more closely. It's also possible that they did basically do it as same as what he did and they didn't replicate it. Okay, so although some of Bartlett's findings might not stand the test of time, there are many reproducible findings showing that memory can be distorted in interesting ways. And we'll talk about those throughout the rest of this course. So even though memory reconstruction may not always head towards some kind of central schema, it does appear to involve some kind of constructive process capable of both returning somewhat accurate impressions of past experiences, but also distorting those impressions of past experiences. We've got uh, two more people to talk about in this part, and I'm trying to make my videos a little shorter than an hour per video, so let's get through this. Here we have Bluma Zygarnik, and she was doing uh, work in around the 40s and the 50s. She's another early memory researcher, and she's famous for the to-do list effect. So Zygarnik investigated an apparent phenomenon showing that uncompleted tasks are remembered better than completed tasks. And I call this an apparent phenomenon because I'll warn you right now, uh, one of the things about the Zygarnik effect is that it also wasn't replicated. So Every time you hear about an effect, it is worth kind of going back to the literature and seeing, okay, was, were other people able to reproduce this thing? I remember learning about this one and thinking, oh, that sounds, I mean, I'm thinking right now, I've got a big to-do list that I have, and I'm thinking about all the things I have to do on that list. You know what I'm not thinking about? All the things I already did that are off the list. So it, it, it seems like a compelling concept uh, and let's take a look at what Zygarnik did to establish this. So participants were given a variety of tasks and each of them took about three to five minutes to complete. So for example, participants would be sitting down and she would say, do some addition or make a drawing of something or start thread, try to thread this needle. 
and partway through some of the tasks, she interrupted people and started them on a new task. So if you're trying to get that thing through the needle, uh, she would say, hey, stop, do some math now. So that would be an, your, uh, your, you trying to do the threading the needle task would have been interrupted in that situation. Other times, people uh, got to complete the task. Now at the end of the experiment, uh, participants had completed some of the tasks and the other ones had remained incomplete. There was a lot of different tasks that people did. And after uh, the performance phase, Zygarnik had participants try to remember all the tasks that they did. So, you know, give me a list, all the ones that you did. And across several experiments, she reliably found that people were able to recall more of the uncompleted tasks than the completed task. So one explanation was that the goal to complete a task created some kind of psychological tension that could only be resolved by completing that task. And when this goal-based tension is not resolved, for example, uh, I'm told to thread a needle. So I'm like, I really got to do that. And if someone interrupts me from doing that, part of me just really needs to finish doing that task. And because I have this tension or whatever, uh, later on when I try to remember all the things that I did, uh, I have better memory for the uncompleted tasks. So that's a story that Zy or that 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 summarizes what Zygarnik found and how she one of the, one of her interpretations of what she found. And um, one thing that happened shortly after that is that Van Bergen published several replication attempts of the original studies and found that participants didn't show systematic differences in their memory for completed and uncompleted tasks. Now, depending on different textbooks that you read, this uh, Zygarnik effect sometimes appears in there as an effect that's like, hey, this is definitely something that happens. And it's sometimes forgotten uh, that it wasn't easy to replicate in 1968. And I'm bringing this up uh, for a couple of reasons. And one reason is, uh, the main reason is just to get us comfortable with the idea that there are memory phenomena out there that people uh, study. And sometimes those phenomena aren't replicable across different laboratories. And so just because one laboratory shows something doesn't mean that thing is really uh, a true memory phenomena necessarily. Um, and we need to be critically minded when we evaluate results from the literature. Okay, the last one here is by Hedwig von Restorff, and she was applying Gestalt theory figure ground concepts to memory, and she was one of the people to demonstrate the role of distinctiveness in memory. Now, to contrast with the Zygarnik effect, the von Restorff effect is very replicable in many different ways. Highly distinctive items are often much easier to remember than things that aren't very distinctive. And you can demonstrate that, uh, people have demonstrated that many ways since von Restorff's first demonstrations. We're going to take a look at how she made this demonstration. And uh, today, people continue to debate and try to understand what it means to be distinctive. Here's some of the big questions. One, what makes some information more memorable than others? And is memory better for things that stand out from the background compared to things that blend 
into the background. Here's what von Restorf did. She tested recall memory for lists of paired items. Now, here's a list of paired items, and this is taken right from her paper. This is the kind of thing that people saw. It looks kind of abstract and weird. We have two nonsense syllables, laugh and rig. We have here two symbols, a hashtag and a plus sign. Um, what else we have? Two more nonsense syllables, doc and peer. And now we've got two numbers and two colored shapes. And then two more nonsense syllables, uh, two uppercase letters, and two more nonsense syllables. So you would be studying these things. And then you get a blank piece of paper, just like this. And what you have to do is write down that whole thing. So you'd have to write down uh, laugh rig. That's the first one. And the second one was hashtag plus. And then the next one, you know, you'd have to write them all down, see how many you could get. All right, so what's the manipulation here? Well, she was interested in distinctiveness and creating situations where some items would act as the quote background stimuli and other items would um, act as the foreground stimuli. In her setup, she identified or labeled the background items masked items. Uh, for example, in this set, the masked items were the nonsense syllables. One, two, three, four, there's four of those. So half of these things were all of one kind of pair. The other items she called the isolated items. These were the unique pairs. So for example, the symbols, numbers, colored shape, and letters. Those are four different kinds of pairs. So we have four of the same pairs, the nonsense syllables, and four different unique pairs. She was interested in whether memory would be different for the massed items, the nonsense syllables in this case, versus the unique items. Now, she did that experiment and you might wonder, wait a minute. Okay. First of all, you should sit back and think, oh, I wonder which one people were better for. Were you better for the nonsense syllables or these unique items? I'll give you a hint. She found people were better for the unique items. And you might wonder, is that just true in general? Or is that just for these things right here? People happen to be better for these symbols, numbers, the red square, green square, and, and S and B, those things compared to nonsense syllables. Maybe that's why there's a difference. What von Restorff did, and this is a very common strategy in cognitive psychology, is to employ a technique called counterbalancing. This is a technique to control for the role of individual stimuli. So von Restorff counterbalanced the massed and isolated items across the different lists. Here's a little picture to show you what I mean by counterbalancing. And in the list that we just saw, there was four nonsense syllables. Those were the massed items. And there was one symbol pair, one pair of numbers, one pair of colored things and one pair of letters. Those were the isolates. So participants would have seen that list. We call it list one. But if we counterbalance these things, we can create other lists where the particular item that is assigned to the masked condition versus the isolate condition can be switched around. Here in list two, the symbols are assigned to the masked condition. So participants would see 
four pairs of symbols, maybe a hashtag and a plus, and a dollar sign and a percent sign, and a star and a parentheses or something like that. And then the masked items would be the a one of each of the four other types of pairs. And as we go across the list, what we see is that each kind of pair takes a turn being the masked item type. Okay. So now we can ask in general, across all of these lists, are people's memory better for the masked item that appears four times? Or are they better for the isolated items where one of a different thing occurs uniquely four times? And here's her results. She did find higher recall of isolated pairs compared to the masked pairs. And this was regardless of the type of material. So she found that across all those different types of lists. And this means that particular, even if particular stimuli were more or less memorable. Um, sorry, let me rephrase this. Particular stimuli were more or less memorable, not in and none of themselves, but in relation to how distinct they were from other stimuli in the set. So your memory for one thing wasn't just how memorable this thing is, your memory for this thing depends on how it is presented against a backdrop of other items. All right, I mentioned before that distinctiveness effects have been replicated many times and in many ways since von Restorff. So people are pretty confident that uh, distinctiveness is an important feature of memory and uh, there's still a lot of big questions about how to make something distinct, uh, but we do think that's very important. That brings us to the end of part one and come back for part two. We'll talk about memory from an information processing perspective and we'll look at the multi-store model of memory. This was formative in around the 1960s for thinking about memory processes. And we can think about it as another metaphor or way to think about memory. All right, that's it for me. See you next time.